Let's stand this morning. We're going to read God's Word and then we'll pray as is uh, custom. So, obviously, you know, some, we've had some new families here. Um, we've been talking about Psalm 91 with the theme of the first two verses of Psalm 91. So this morning, because we didn't do it two week, uh, wow. last week, we will read Psalm 91 again. I'll ask Brother Scotty to come forward. We'll read Psalm 91 again, and then we're going to also read another psalm. So um, let's get everybody's mind refreshed, focus right, Psalm 91, the whole psalm, and then we will also read Psalm 6. So Psalm 91 first, and then we will read Psalm 6. Brother. Psalm 91. My NSB says, Security of the one who trusts in the Lord. He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give you his angels charge concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will rescue him and honour him. With a long life I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Amen. Also Psalm 6. Please turn to Psalm 6. Psalm 6. The Bible says, Prayer for mercy in time of trouble. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pinning away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed, and my soul is greatly dismayed. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. For there is no mention of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eyes have wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. Depart from me, all you who, who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. Amen. Amen. 
Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord God, we thank you that we have the privilege of opening your word here, Lord God. Lord, we acknowledge that this is not a word of a man, Lord God. We, we know this is the eternal word. This is the enduring word, the everlasting word. And Lord, where everything, everything and everyone will be measured by. Amen. And Lord, this morning, Lord, we are not interested in man's ideas. We're not interested in any, any opinions. We want to hear what you say, Lord God. What is your will, Lord God? And this morning, I pray, Lord God, that we'll have an encounter with the living word this morning. Every heart here, Lord, every mind, Lord, that light will shine and enter, Lord, into the mind, into the heart this morning. Lord, from the youngest to the oldest this morning, Lord, grant understanding, Jesus. Lord, help me to speak in a way, Lord, that is not a stumbling block, Lord God, but helps people to hear your truth and hear your voice, Lord Jesus. I need your help, Lord God. And your people need your grace this morning, Lord. Please, Father God, be gracious to us this morning. Let there be an abundance of grace here this morning. Transform us. Transform us this morning, Lord. You have the power to change us, Lord God. You have the power this morning to take your word and to break strongholds in people, Lord God. To break chains, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Praise the Lord. We've been speaking about he who dwells in this hiding place, this secret place, this shelter of the Most High, who abides in the shadow of Al Shaddai, or, you know, in our English, Almighty. You know. We've been speaking about this in Psalm 91, and, you know, and I've been talking about how, how we can walk and live and abide in this shadow of the Almighty. That's the first two verses of Psalm 91. We have not really had the, the opportunity yet to meditate on the rest of the psalm on what happens with one. What, what is the experience uh, that one has? What's the fruit that this person has when he dwells in this shelter of the Most High, when he's in the shadow of the Almighty? What happens? We haven't, haven't been able to look at that yet. And maybe today we still won't be able to, to go to the rest of the psalm there. But I'm still being asked by the Lord, and I, I feel still led by the Holy Spirit as I was spending time with Jesus even last night. Brother Sam phoned me last night and said, he, you know, you heard this morning he was feeling sick. And so I went to the Lord, and I, I, I was thinking about continuing down now in the psalm and talking about these things. But the Lord put something still else in my heart, speaking about being in this, living in this, abiding in this place, this shelter, this hiding place, this secret place. And, you know, for those, obviously, who, who have not been here or haven't followed the messages, we've essentially looked at how Jesus defined the secret place, that the secret place is not, is not just, you know, being in a monastery somewhere praying, um, uh, for, for a period of time. He says this man dwells. He dwells there. He dwells in the secret. He lives there. He is not a visitor to this secret place. He doesn't visit this secret place. He lives there. He dwells there. And Jesus uses the word secret in Matthew chapter 6 three times. He says that we are to give in secret. We are to pray in secret. We are to fast in secret. And our Father who sees in secret will reward us. And Jesus, you know, expound on this secret life that it is about living before God, living before His eyes, always being aware of His presence, His will, living like that, living in His presence. And the more you cultivate that relationship, in, you'll experience the reality that we read of in Psalm 91 of God's unbelievable protection, but not just the fact that God protects you. This confidence of a believer, of a saint, to know that God is my refuge. God is my fortress. I trust in Him. Why? Because I know the Lord. I'm with Him all day. I see Him. You know what the Bible says, how faith works? It works through something. You know how it says in Galatians, if we have time, we'll look at that today. It's, Paul says in Galatians, he says, 
It's neither circumcision or uncircumcision that counts for anything. It's neither these things count for anything, but rather faith that works through love. Faith that works through love. Faith works through love. If you want to increase your faith, increase your love. <laughs> increase your love. What is this love? Again, you know, and we've, we've, when you start to get to know someone, your potential of trusting him is limited. And you only know this person this bit. The problem of our understanding of faith is it is a mental ascent. So we think the more I see certain principles, read certain accounts, and I just will power that I will believe it. That's what we think faith is. But rather no, is if as you get to know the Lord and you see how He is faithful in your life, you grow in, in, in trusting Him. You, he's taking you through this, and He's taking you through that, and He's taking you through this, and you're able to trust Him more and more and more. David says, when he has to face Goliath, he says, I can face Goliath. You know why? Because when the bear and the lion came, God was there. My faith increased. You see? Amen? Amen? Faith works through love. If you have struggles in this area, again, those who know the Lord, if you ever seen somebody who knows the Lord, really walks with the Lord, and struggles with doubt, it doesn't work like that. Those who walk close with the Lord abides in His shadow, experiences, see things for how they really are. Faith is like that. Now, what I have in my heart to discuss today is probably going to offend a lot of you, and, and that's not my desire. My desire is I don't come to church wanting to offend people. All right, That's not my desire. But I pray that you, you see my heart. This is something that Jesus put on my heart. And it's about, again, what the, are the veils? What hinders us from staying in this secret place? Right. Because Psalm 6 is a very, very, very good psalm for us to learn a lesson from David. Right. Because David here in this psalm is experiencing, obviously, some, uh, you know, a trial in his life. And it's clear that he has sinned. Why do I say that in Psalm 6? Well, he begins the psalm to acknowledge that he is under the discipline. God's disciplining him for something. He says, God, please do not rebuke me in your anger. And please do not discipline me in your wrath. Dave, David is aware that there is sin in his life. Right? Thank you, brother. David is aware that there's, that there's obviously been sin in his life. And in verse 4, this is a very important verse in Psalm 6, he prays, return, O Lord, and deliver my life. Fellowship has been broken in some sense, between David and the Lord. And in this psalm, verses 1 to 7, it is an utter cry out of the depths of David's heart. I mean, you, you get, you get to, to a window into his secret life and how he's feeling and what the situation is. And we'll walk a little bit through that. But if you look from verse 8 to 10, it is like somebody else wrote it. The first seven verses of Psalm 6 is, you know, David seemingly at the scraping at the bottom of the barrel. And then verse 8, it's like, well, somebody else is, is finishing the psalm. <laughs> and I feel this is a, something that the Lord has put on my heart to share with you, church, about abiding and dwelling in the shadow of El Shaddai to know what it means to walk in there. Because I tell you something, and I shared it with, my, with our uh, home group 
last week. One of the things that I think, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something I really despise and it really gives people the wrong idea is that they think a godly man or a godly woman never sin. Right? And so what happens in church is that there is sometimes a culture and this happens to pastors and elders where this expectation is, is that they should never do anything wrong. Should never sin. And what that, that creates is that the pastor lives a fake life. And that encourages all everybody else to live a fake life. Rather, how it should be is that the mature in the house of God, if they do sin, they should show the church an example of what you do when you do make a mistake, when you do fall. Humble yourself. Ask forgiveness. Don't be prideful. Right? So that, that culture is not in church because pastors ought to be... Holiness is perfection. And our children never learn how to, how to repent because we, we don't do that. Because we, you're always right. You're always perfect. That needs to break. Right? What I love about the Psalms is that we get into David's life and we see this repentance. Now, Psalm 6 is the first of seven what they call penitential Psalms. Repentance Psalms. In the whole Psalter, you know, Psalm, Psalm 6 is the first of seven. You've got Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 51 that we all know, you know, Psalm 102, Psalm 130, and Psalm 143. They are this collection of the penitential Psalms, repentance Psalms. And I challenge you, if you ever want to, you know, let God work in you in, with regards to repentance, Take those seven and meditate on them. See what God can teach you. Amen? Awesome, awesome. Man, that's a, that's, that can be an awesome series as well. Awesome to go through these Psalms. They all highlight something unique. But what God wants for us to look here, what I want to see here is that David, obviously we are not, as you, normally with a lot of David's Psalms and some of the other Psalms, an event is attached to the Psalm. You know, somewhere that you can attach it to David's life. Now, this psalm, people speculate and so on, but there is no event in David's life that's attached to this psalm. So, no, we don't know. All we, we can deduce from this psalm is that David, at some point, was, you know, walking away from the Lord, and he's now under the discipline of God. Now, can I just say... Even when we walk in that holy place, sometimes we're going to find ourselves in a place where we have not listened to the Lord. And this is what I want to start seeing in us, that we have this ability that even if when we do fall and we find out that we fall and that we are able to run back, right? Run back and, 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 and stay in that place. For many of us, what I see is that if we fall, we fall really hard. We do not have this ability to abide there, to stay there. And staying there, I'm going to highlight this again and again, staying there does not mean that you have to be perfect. It means that there's a certain way of walking with the Lord. And if the Lord shows you something that is wrong, that you repent of it, you confess it, you, you deal with that situation and you can abide in there. You know, John tells us in, in, in his letter, he says, My little children, I write these things to you so you may not sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, right? So th th there is a way of walking in the light, walking with Jesus, and Jesus is constantly washing you and cleansing you with the blood, and you're growing spiritually, right? But we can learn here from David, is even David, if you read his, his uh, you know, if you read through Samuel, and you, you get so quickly, David was so unique from all other kings about how much he spoke to the Lord, 
how he asked counsel from God, always seeking the Lord's counsel, always seeking God's approval, whether he should advance, whether he should not advance, what should he do. He was always speaking with the Lord. But something in his life, and I highly doubt this was, this was uh, what happened with Bathsheba and Horiah, but something went wrong and he didn't notice. And it brought the discipline of the Lord. Now, I know this is disappearing and it's not preached much, but you know that the Lord disciplines whom He loves. Amen? Amen. So the first thing that we have to see here, before you see anything, because people have such distorted views of God, God loves David. Because God's disciplining him. When we read, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger, and you can see people are already getting scared. Thank the Lord He's rebuking. Thank the Lord He corrects. Thank you, the Lord He disciplines. Amen? That's the Lord, even though, uh, you know, we see discipline disappearing in, in every aspect of society, in family, everything, the Lord will not do this. He's, he's a good father. These terms, rebuke and discipline, in the Bible, in the, in the Hebrew language, these terms are used of a father merely. So already David here is, is seeing God as his father. And he is in a situation. Now he is obviously at a desperate situation. He has probably come to a situation where he has ignored the Lord. And, ignored, and he is now in a situation where he's crying out for mercy. And, he, and you know, he's crying out, say, Lord, please. Please forgive me. Please don't, don't, don't rebuke me in your anger. Don't discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord. Be gracious to me. I am, I, am, you know, I am languishing. I am fainting. My strength is gone. My bones are, are, are vexed. You know, it, it, they are troubled. Troubled, troubled. My soul, my soul is also greatly, greatly troubled. But you, O oh Lord, how long? How long? Have you been in a place like that? You know, this, this idea of where he talks about his bones, his soul. If you, again, if you trace this throughout the Old Testament, it's basically saying, my body is a mess. My mind is a mess. I am not coping in any sense. I have no peace in my mind. I'm getting sick, my body, I'm not getting, you'll see later on he talks about that he doesn't get any sleep. He is, he, he, he is in serious, serious trouble, right? He's in serious, serious trouble and he's, he's calling for the Lord, Lord, please be merciful. Now, the main point, the main point today that I want to think, you know, for you to take home today is... When we are in that secret place, right? We're in that secret place. We are with the Lord. And then we walk away from the Lord. Whatever, whatever we do, we take our eyes of Jesus. We go and do something we shouldn't do. We'll, we'll talk about some of these things. But what is the main thing that happens when we leave that holy place? And what happened in David's life? And this is the thing that I want you to start recognizing in your life. Paul talks about in Galatians, about keeping in step with the Spirit. Over and over again, he tells the believers, walk in the Spirit. Be in the Spirit. I believe being in the Spirit is, is the same as, as being in the secret place, right? Being in the secret place. Be in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Have your being in the Spirit. All of these things are speaking about the same reality. And what happens when we move from the Spirit to the flesh? What is the thing that vanishes suddenly? And what we see absent here, what David is saying, Lord, please return and d deliver, deliver my life, Lord. Where, where are you? And I always find it, you know, we have this verse. The Lord will never what? The Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. 
What does David pray here? Return. Return, O Lord. But in the first verse, he also acknowledges that the Lord is currently what? Disciplining him. So it's not that the Lord is forsaken him. It's not that the Lord is completely absent. But there's something of the Lord that is missing. That he feels distant. That's gone. And I want to tell you, when you move from the Spirit to the flesh, when you leave that secret place, I, was, I think I was sharing with some of the brothers how the Lord showed me with, with the church of Ephesus. Remember Ephesus? He says this, you have left your first love, place that you've left. I think it's the same place. This, this, you can see this place everywhere in Scripture. And look at what Jesus does with these churches, these seven churches. He tells them their secret life as opposed to what people see, right? But what happens? The removal of grace. There's no more grace in David's life. No more grace. There is no grace. Now, what, what, sometimes we talk about, brother, my peace is gone. Brother, my joy is gone. Brother, my power over sin is gone. Those are all fruits of grace in your life. When you're in that place, there's an abundance of grace. Grace, God works, everything comes from His grace. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. Everything, even it says the life of Jesus is administered by grace through faith. By grace. All of it. But there are things that separate us from this grace or that becomes veils of this grace. And David was finding him in a place where he's, Lord, return to me. Deliver my life, Lord. Save me. Save me. Look at, look at the things. He first talks about be gracious. This term is being merciful. It's a, it's a covenant term in verse uh, uh, 2. And then in verse 4, he says, Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Again, chesed. Mercy, faithfulness, love in covenant. David is saying, Lord, please, I'm calling to your commitment to this covenant that you've made. The commitment that to your people. He's not appealing to his performance, his, his righteousness. He's saying, Lord, I need your covenant faithfulness, your grace in my life. Chesed is the closest, he, uh, grace is the closest word probably we can get to to chesed in, in the Old Testament. It encompasses all the things, the, the love, the, the faithfulness of God, all of these things, all of these things. And David is experiencing when whatever it is that has made him fall from this place, right? Again, God says to, to the church of Ephesus, remember where you have fallen from. You've fallen from this high place. You've left this First love, right? And he's saying, that, that, then what we see in the first seven verses is a man who lacks grace in his life. And I want to challenge you this morning. If the things that we read in this chapter, chapter 6, these first seven verses, remind you of where you are. My brother and my sister, it's time to return to grace. It's time to return to this place. David is, is, is in this place. Look at how, what he goes on to say. I mean, he, he talks about the fact that he is weary of, of um, his, his moaning. He's, he's drenched. His bed is, is full of tears. His couch is full of, the, of, of weeping. He says his eyes is wasting away. He's, he's not sleeping. This man has no peace. And he says he's full of grief. He's, he's describing the prayer. He is anxious. And he says, my eyes is even becoming weak because of all my foes. Look at where his, his eyes is, is all on his enemies. He's discouraged. He has, you know, if you look at the David in, 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 in Samuel, when he saw somebody challenging God, when he saw any foreign people rising up against the people of God, 
He was ready to fight. He was a man full of faith. David is the one, what? Who slays ten thousands, right? Saul kills thousands. Who does David kill? Ten thousands. Here is this man. This, that, that same man. That's what you're reading, right? He, he is full of grief and he is completely discouraged. Completely discouraged. Lord, I need, I need grace in my life. I don't have any grace in my life. Now, grace is not something you earn, but it is something you receive. And receive is still a doing word. Amen? Grace is still something you must receive. And I wonder whether we have been as a people, and there's only one place where you receive grace. This is before the Lord. This is the secret place. There's an abundance of grace. Abundance of grace. What does the book of Hebrews say? Where should we go to find help in the time of need? To the throne of mercy and grace. Where, what is that throne? What does that represent? That's the Holy of Holies. That's where you run to, to receive grace in the time of need. But brothers and sisters, I don't think we know what this is. So we find ourselves many times perhaps in verse 1 to 7. But do we ever get to verse 8, 9, and 10? And that's my challenge this morning. So I want to speak quickly, because again, time is just flying so fast. What are these things that can remove the grace of God out of our lives? Some of these things we know. Some of these things we don't, we, you know, we, we might have to hear again. But I pray as I list these things, please, Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart this morning. God wants to give you grace. Amen? God wants to see you in verse 8, 9, and 10, to be in that place. But these things need to be addressed. God has removed the veil. He has invited us. But there are things that can hinder the grace of God in our lives. Number one, the one that we all should know, in this verse we should know off by heart. God opposes what? Proud. The proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride. Now again, we are not told in this psalm what David, where he fell. As I go, I've got, I think I've got seven things that I want to mention. It's customary in church. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's popular in church. Everybody says every root, every sin, you know, the root is pride. That's, what, that's probably what you've heard many times. I, I don't think so. I think these seven things, each one can be a root. Is it just my opinion? No, because God's Word says, for example, there are roots of other things. One, one for example, is that the, the love of money is what? the root of all kinds of evil. A different root. Right? So they can, all these things, I think, can be a root that hinders God's grace in our life. Pride. Now, this pride in our lives, one thing I, I'm, I want to be, I want to try to be an example in this area is that, brothers, we, we must not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And that takes intentionally humbling ourselves and being an open fellowship and being accountable to one another. This is something that can happen in church easily. But pride is some of the most deceitful sins there is. It's something that you can be completely blind to. It's something a church can be blind to. You say, no, the church can be blind to that. Sardis was, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Right? You have this great reputation, right? It is it's such a deceitful thing. And it requires us to intentionally humble ourselves. Humble yourself before the Lord. 
You know, there are multiple examples in Scripture where you can go and study this, this sin, pride, and how it manifests. It manifests in very different ways. Some, for people, it's about, you know, getting recognition, like, like, like Nebuchadnezzar in, in, in Daniel 4, when he said, when he was looking at Babylon, and he said, oh, I built this with my power and for my majesty and glory. And right then when he said it, there's a voice that came out of heaven, and it says, today the kingdom departs from you. Today. Grace, immediately, even, even in how God deals with the nations, this principle is there. Those who exalt themselves, God opposes. And this word opposes, it's, an, it's, it's not passive. It's not that God just says, okay, I withdraws. He actively opposes the proud. And He gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. But I think one of the most Decept deceitful, right? Deceptive pride examples in the Bible is probably Job. Because he was a righteous man. And in many cases, still today, I believe many believers still think Job had a case <laughs> with, with God. <laughs> this, this, you know, he, he argues and argues with his, the, the, you know, his friends. And in the end... Job is found out for pride. Pride was in his life, right? And the, the simple pride was, he was saying, look, God, I want to I come into your presence and I want to argue my case. I want to know why, because I believe I'm right. Which means there's error on your side. And it's only when God comes down and gives, gives Job and, and he sees God for who he is, that Job says, hang on, but you are so above me. What, who you are is so bigger than I. How could I have ever questioned? I don't see what you see. I can't do what you do. But yet I was willing to question you. To question you. And many times this sin, you know, it, it just appears slightly in us. Well, I think I deserve better treatment than that brother over there. I think I should be recognized more for, for, for what I do. <laughs> There's subtle, subtle pride in us. And the moment the Lord sees pride, there can be a cut of grace in our lives. Let us be radical with pride. Amen? Let us be radical in this area. Pride is so subtle. And, you know, pride is such a, is a, a, a trick because it's your best friend. He defends you. When that person calls you out, you say, hey, don't listen to him. You're a good guy. You're a good woman. Brothers and sisters, don't allow this in your life. Don't let the voice of pride be in your life. Amen. Humble yourself before the Lord. Humility is something that you have to learn. Jesus says this is something you can learn from Him. It's a very practical thing. Very practical thing. I'm sure that in areas in our lives, this is a big issue. I see pride a lot in... You know, I said I'm going to offend people today. Again, this is not my intention, but I, I see this a lot in how we try to keep our appearance before others. We really care what people think about us. And it hinders so much of the grace of God in our lives, so much things that God wants to do in our lives if we are willing to just let it go. Let it go. Will you help me to do that? And I'll help you to do that. Amen? Let's get rid of pride in the church. Let's get rid of these things. Jesus, help us in this area. The second thing that can hinder grace. The New Testament is very clear. Grace comes through faith. Amen? Grace comes through faith. So unbelief can be a huge obstacle to grace in our lives. 
Unbelief can be a huge obstacle to grace in our life. I shared, Brother Sam, sorry, Brother Sam shared this morning about the Lord will fight your battles for you. There's one battle He won't fight for you. You know what battle that is? The battle of faith. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. You must believe. You must believe, church. It is something that we have to cultivate in the church. And I shared from Galatians how important it is that we, you know, faith can grow through this love. Faith works through love. But it is so important that we cultivate faith in us. Unbelief is so, it just cuts, cuts grace. You know, uh, we, we, we read these, these passages in Scripture, but sometimes I just feel it doesn't, it doesn't have, it, have its impact in us because we've grown up with them, we've heard them so many times. But I'm stunned in places where it says that Jesus could not perform any miracles or do any signs because the people did not believe. They didn't believe. There wasn't faith there. How many times did Jesus say to the people, let it be done, what? According to your faith, let it be done. Now, Jesus, you know, is not expecting a mature faith from a young believer. Right? But our, our, our you know, this, this thing I see in us is our tendency to so quickly go to the flesh and not trust God. This is someone very, very clear that, that does not have this abiding place. Because in this abiding place, there is immense grace. Immense grace. And you know the Lord. And this person says, this is my, my rock. God is my, my rock, my refuge, my fortress. He is the one I trust. He is the one I believe in. And unbelief is, is just so apparent. This is something that we, we, we have to cultivate in our lives. Faith, brothers and sisters. Now, the example in, in the Bible of what the Bible uses over and over again is Israel not entering the promised land. Not entering the promised land. I just want to share this because it says the word came to them. And they, the word did not profit them because they did not mix the word with faith. Right? Now, what is faith, essentially? Right? What, what, how are we going to just boil it down and, and help us try and work at this faith? The book of Hebrews is an awesome book to read on this. I believe it is crucial to the whole book the, 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 the climax Hebrews 11 is to, for us to understand faith and Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that it is impossible to please God without faith and if you want to draw near to God the book of Hebrews says you must do two things now drawing near to God is synonymous with faith right if you if you want to have faith there's two important things that must be a reality. First, he says, you must believe that God exists. It's, we translate it like that. But what essentially it is, you must believe that God is who He says He is. You must believe that God is who He says He is. This is foundational to faith. Foundational. And secondly, you must believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, I, I want, when we started the home fellowships, I had this on my heart, that we walk through the, the Gospel of Matthew and to focus on the character of Jesus because the Bible says that He is the exact imprint of God's nature. He is the glory of God on display. Jesus. If you want to know who God is, the fullest picture, Jesus. Jesus. There's no, no, no God behind Jesus that you haven't seen yet. He is the exact imprint of God's nature. He has made the invisible God visible. 
But faith starts by believing who God says He is. Saying, okay, God, you says this, and this is what I believe God's going to do in, in the camp and in the times to go, come in. God knows that in these foundational things, we really struggle. We really, really struggle. Because God, many times, appeals to you based upon who He is. And if there is not something you can hold on or trust in, and the character is not something you can anchor yourself in, that's really, really difficult to have faith. Very difficult. Very difficult to believe anyone, anyone, if you don't know them. It must start with believing who God says He is. And that He keeps His word. Amen? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Unbelief is the opposite of that. We don't believe who God is. How many, I mean, this is much of my counseling, is about people who believe something else about God. Something else about the Lord. And I want to challenge you, brother and sister, start working in this area. If it takes you to take some passages about what God says about who He is, and, and starting to, to hold on to them and, and, and to, to, to read them more. We have to fill ourselves with the Word of God. The Bible also says faith comes by what? Hearing. And uh, hearing the Word of God. Right? So we have to be full of the Word of, full of, the word of God. What often happens is that we, we expose ourselves so little to the Word of God. We, we are so little in that secret place. But we are a lot in front of other media and all of that. And so that will dominate our view. That will. And here is something I, I want to speak out. That's a, a real big burden on my heart. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, from verse 18 to 20, he's talking about people who have shipwrecked their faith because he says they didn't keep their faith and they didn't keep what? A good conscience before the Lord. And in this area, when we, when we abide in that place, when we are in that dwe dwelling place with the Lord, our conscience is the way that God speaks to us. It is how God speaks to us to direct us in terms of whether, whether we are, especially whether, whether we are wrong. He convicts us there, right? He speaks to us. And when God speaks to us in our conscience and convicts us, it's important to listen to that. But what happens is your conscience is, is like a, it, it's something that can be calibrated to different things. And Paul makes sure he, want, he wants people for their faith to be in God, for their faith to be in the character of God, and for their, their, their conscience to be calibrated to the will of God, to the word of God, to who God is, that your conscience will respond to God. So when something is wrong, when something is, you're, you're, you're going off, God can easily speak to you. God can easily lead you. You know, the problem for us is, and this is in so many brothers and sisters today, is that we, have, we come from different backgrounds, right? One of the big things that can, that can uh, uh, affect our conscience is culture. Because culture also tells you what's right and what's wrong. Culture also can calibrate this. And that's why you see in the world, look in the world now. This wasn't, this wasn't uh, 30 years ago. But today, if you say a man loving another man or marrying another man is wrong, some people sincerely get angry. Their conscience is perverted by the culture of this world, by the spirit of this age, calibrated to that, right? Some people, their conscience is calibrated to tradition. This is especially with what you've been, like at home or in church, tradition, what you've been brought up. So, and this is where bondage can be really strong, really strong. You were taught a certain thing. It's not in the Bible, but you were taught it. 
And then somebody <laughs> challenges that. And your conscience, you, you feel like this is, this is so wrong. I hope you can see why it was so difficult for the Jews. Man, circumcision, eating certain things, you know, worshipping on certain days, the feast. These are, these are God things, but they also grew up. It was part of their culture. And when Paul was trying to speak about a greater reality that Jesus has brought, it was so, so difficult for them, to, for their consciences to be recalibrated. And in church, you'll find this all over the time. You have people whose consciences have been affected by sin, deep sin. So they are now oversensitive. Some believers are not sensitive enough in areas. Some believers are bound by traditions. Some believers are formed by culture. Some are, 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 are you know, affected by how they were brought up. And all of this, God wants to say, look, come here. The book of Hebrews says, God takes the blood and He washes your conscience clean. He washes it. Because all of us have areas in our conscience. This is affecting how we hear God, how we receive God's Word, right? All of us have been affected in areas. None of our cultures are perfect and holy. I don't care whether you are, you know, Eskimo or whatever it is. All of us have things in our culture that are not Christ-like. All of us have upbringing that was not Christ-like. All of us have understandings about God that is not Christ-like. And it starts here again. Say, God, look, I need my conscience. This is something I'm going to take very seriously. I want my conscience to be clean before you. I want my conscience... To be calibrated to your voice, Lord, to your voice. So when you speak, I hear you clearly. I have your heart. My sheep hear my voice. In this area, even if I don't even continue further, there's a lot of work here. When I hear a lot of brothers, they are so oversensitive in areas in their life. I found it, you know what's amazing to me? This is, this is not, the, obviously there's exceptions to this, but in ministering to people, people who come from deep sin backgrounds, they've been in deep sin and then they got born again. Often, they are now oversensitive about things and God needs to recalibrate them. But I found people who grow up in church, their conscience is desensitized they're not sensitive at all. They don't get convicted of sin. They're so used to. And, and what has happened is that the Word of God is, in these things has just been tradition. They're not sensitive. And, you know, it starts with, with going into the secret place and saying to God, Lord, I need my conscience washed. And maybe I'm oversensitive for things. Maybe I'm desensitized. Maybe it's my culture. Maybe it's tradition. But I'm not here to please anybody, Lord. I want to please you. I want to hear you correctly when you speak to me. And if, I want a clean conscience, Lord God. I want a clean conscience. And people who have clean consciences, they are so easily led by the Holy Spirit. It's so easy for God to speak to them. It's clean. And God will calibrate more and more. Now, the way you renew, because the Bible says you have to, this is part of renewing the mind, right? You have to renew your mind. Romans 12 says to us that transformation is directly linked to the mind, right? He says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, all of these things are, are connected and it affects our faith. Our faith can, the more our mind is renewed, our faith can grow. The more our conscience is being calibrated to the Word of God. I remember when I started as a believer and I, I had beliefs about certain things. I had views about certain things and I would read and I would say, oh, God, you, you're different to me in this area. I, I did not see and God recalibrates my conscience. Now I start to see, you know, 
actually that is, that is the truth. What I believe, what I thought is wrong. Does this happen in your life? When you read the God, are you still growing in these areas? Because I find many people are still stuck in the same lifeless tradition, same things for their whole life. They, they, there's no growth in this area. Jesus has not calibrated anything. You know, when I started, to, when I started my, my walk, I believed so many different things than what I leave, believe today. And that's how it should be. Amen? Don't you grow? If you still believe what you believe in year one, then there's a problem. <laughs> you grow in your understanding. And because of that, God's really humbled me in this area. And where in the past I've been very impatient with others. Judging people for believing things and all of that. You know, I'm not talking about fundamental things. I'm talking about, you know, you know all the things that we believe we are a bit more righteous than somebody else because we've got light in this area. God works in us. And it's this secret place, you know, where you find these truths. You know, I have found so many times, man, I, I have argued with a brother about a certain text. And this hasn't proved anything. And then three weeks later, he comes, he probably doesn't even know, and he says, God spoke to me something. And I go, and he shares. And I'm like, what? That's what I tried to tell you three, three weeks ago. In that place, God, as I said last week, God's the only one who can teach you certain things in this secret place. Let Him wash your conscience. Let Him cleanse that. Cleanse your, your recalibrate your conscience that you can, your faith can grow. Amen? Number three, self-righteousness. Let me just check because I am, yeah, I'm, I'm running out of time again. <clears throat> Let me leave these things aside and let me just focus then on the heart of the message. We see David here. He has all of these troubles. He is in a very, very bad place. He has no grace in his life and he's, he's pleading for God. Pleading, you know the name that is used here, it's translated Lord, but it's the full capitals. It's Jehovah. It's, it's Yahweh. It's the covenant name of God. He's calling God on His covenant name and He's appealing to God's covenant faithfulness to restore Him. But what I love about David in this psalm, and this is something that I want us to learn, is that David realizes that there's, the grace is gone out of his life. And he humbles himself before the, before the Lord and he cries out, and it gets to verse 8. And something happens to David. And this is my prayer that this is something we experience, church, in our walks with Jesus. That we will have periods where we take our eyes off Jesus and we, we slip in a banana peel. Or we, we fall from, from the Lord. But we find, we realize, we humble ourselves. Look at David's what I love and what I see so little of in the church is look at David's agony. He is really desperate to get back to the Lord. Back to the Lord. I see a lot of sometimes crying and weeping, but it's people who want just, you know, relief in terms of their circumstances. David is yearning to be back. Lord, return to me. Yes, I want deliverance. Yes, I want uh, freedom, but he has a cry to be back with the Lord. And then he gets in this place where I believe he has a breakthrough. Right? In the middle, uh, at, at the end of verse 7, he has this breakthrough in his heart. And he, he realizes, wow. I don't know if you've had those experiences. I, I, you know, I've, I've been disciplined by the Lord. I've been in places where I've sense the grace of God vanishing in my life. And I be in that place and I cry out to God and I say, God, be merciful to me, Lord. I, I am, I'm a sinner, Lord. I'm full of pride. I, I am, I'm a wretched. I, I'm sorry, Lord, for how I treated my wife. Or Lord, I'm sorry I, I treated that brother wrong, Lord God. I'm, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a mess, God. Forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus. And in that place, I just receive God's 
grace right there. And nothing has changed yet. Nothing has changed yet. But this faith enters my heart. And this is what I want to see. Look at David's response. He, he believes God. He goes in verse 8 and he says, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. I, I can imagine that in this place, David had many people around him telling him all kinds of things. All kinds of things. But his confidence is in the Lord. His faith is in God. And he says, get, get, all, get all you get, get out. Depart from me. Why? Because God has heard my weeping. Right? He heard the sound of my weeping. He's heard my plea. He's accepted my prayer. And now, he's speaking future tense. My enemies, they will be put to shame. They will, be, they will be put to shame. And in a moment, they're going to be destroyed. All of it is, is going to be fixed. Future tense. Look at the faith of David. Why? He's entered back into that secret place. I'm restored with the Lord. I feel one thing that, you know, I'm being very honest. It is not, you know, the, 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 the most terrible thing, and I've said this to other brothers as well, is not that you fall. But it's that you don't return. It's that you don't get up. Jesus has given us grace to stand up, to be restored, church. To find God in that place of anguish and anxiety. It is not the will of God for believers to be in constant, continual anxiety. Constant, continual fear. Constant, continual doubt. This is not the will of God. Constant and continual uh, 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 power, no, uh, defeated life. No power over sin. Become desperate. Get back into that place. Be restored. If there's pride in your life, if there's unbelief in your life, if there's self-righteousness in your life, if there's unconfessed sin in your life, if there's unforgiveness in your life, all of these things, get to God, get restored in that holy place. I feel this is something that we all talk about, but it's something that is not an everyday walk thing we can get right with the Lord we can we don't have to be in this place of anxiety all the time fear all the time doubt all the time if it's if there is things that you have to then you have to then ask yourself here what is hindering the grace of God in my life there's, is there something hindering the grace of God in my life because God does not have favorites God doesn't just give grace to Ben or, or, or Sam or Levi or any. He doesn't just pick a person and say, I'll have grace on you. There's something hindering the grace of God. What is hindering the grace of God in your life? Do you care so much about what people think? Is there, is, is there bitterness against a brother or sister? You know, unconfessed sin, unrepentant sin. But, Normally, the three things I found, where there's a hidden sin that's hindering the fellowship there, that's broken the fellowship, there's something. It's usually unforgiveness, bitterness, or a sin that brings shame. And a person doesn't want to talk about it because it's shameful. So they, they, they hide it. It's an unrepented, unconfessed, unresolved matter. Is these things in your life, is, is the grace of God hindering you? Because I tell you now, one who learns to walk with Jesus, and I can sense it in my life, I am not, you know, where, where I, I'm going to be when Jesus returns, I'm far from perfect, but I can tell you now, when I move from the spirit to the flesh, I sense it, even, even if it's not a moment, it's that afternoon or it's the next day, but there's a clear, the grace of God, there's, there's something there, and I have to go to the Lord and, and, and make things right. Is that a habit in your life? Is that a habit in your life? Because without the grace of God, without His grace, there's only verses 1 to 7. There's never verses 8 to 10. 
I like so many times of the Psalms, and I'll finish with this, where David seems to be, he says this many times, how long, you can go this, I think there's about eight Psalms where he cries to God, how long, Lord? He asks also that question that we tell people never to ask God. He asks in his Psalms, he asks why? Why is these things happening? He's, he's, he's there and he is he's seeking God and he knows that he needs to find himself in right relationship with God again. Once he enters that place, everything else will fall into place. And in this area, this is what we are to seek to cultivate in our lives. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, who abides in the shadow of El Shaddai. I have this reality, brothers and sisters. Grace is something you must receive. You must be in a place of grace. God wants you to be in that place of grace. I find it, you know, some of these verses really, it, it's, it's hard to put into words, but it, it really, it's heavy on my heart when I see Jesus perform all these signs, all these miracles, and He says, you know, if I did this in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. But in your... You, 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 you who have the Word of God, who have all of these things, they just had no relationship with God. There was nothing cultivated in them. And even when Jesus performed signs and miracles, the grace of God was all around them. All around them. Can you imagine listening to Jesus speak? Casting out demons, performing. The kingdom of God was powerfully all among them. The God's kingdom was there. There was grace there. And it did not penetrate the heart. Let us disarm these things. Amen? Rip these things. Say, Lord, I, I, you know, I want to come before you. I, I, don't, I don't know if we have time. Let, let's see if we have time. I want to give. I have this on my heart. I want to just give us some time this morning. Do you want to get right with Jesus? Is there things in your life? If Jesus touched anything, maybe there are some things that I didn't even mention that Jesus touched th this morning. Say, you know what? This is a hindrance and I need to confess this. You know, even brothers who, who struggle with confession. Should I confess it? Should I not confess it? <sighs> Conscience. So difficult to know. Are you tired of this? Like David, he says, I'm weary. I'm weary of this. I seek to be in peace with Jesus. To be in this relationship. To know His will. What is it that the Holy Spirit is putting on His hand? He says, look, my son, my daughter, this needs, this needs to be out of your life. This is an obstacle. Get this out of your life. I'm ready to deal with you. I'm ready to lavish my grace upon you. To fill you. It's no, no use, you know, I say this, say this many times to Brother Sam, and it's, it's not to discourage us from praying for the Holy Spirit. But look at these Psalms. God has given us these Psalms to say, you have to wrestle with God sometimes. <laughs> wrestle with the Lord. Get things sorted in your heart. You can come here and pray for the Holy Spirit, but there is a battle in your heart. There is things in your life that you are not dealing with. You're not. This is the time to deal with it. Get right with the Lord, right? Deal with these situations. David was a man who wrestled with God. Jacob, when did God... He said, Lord, I need your blessing. But right there, when Jacob had, to, Jacob had to first deal with who he was and his sinfulness, and he was wrestling with God the whole night, but he walked away a blessed man. A blessed man. Do you seek the blessing of the Lord? Grab hold of Jesus. Grab hold of Him. Sometimes, and I, and I want to share this with you, because practically this, this is so important. Sometimes you'll feel... And I've had this in experience. Sometimes it is a prayer of two words. 
that brings the grace of God back into my life. Other times, depending on what it was, I had to shut myself up and wrestle with God for hours because my heart was hard. I didn't want to repent. I, I said I want to repent, but, but God says, no, your heart does not want to repent. And I had to wrestle that God break me. And I finally let go and say, Lord, take this, take this. And grace comes, grace comes. Do you, do you know this? This is, this is relationship with God. He, he breaks things down for you. He helps you to surrender in that place and then you can let go, you can let things go. Sometimes it takes, you know, like I said, it can take sometimes just, you know, looking up and, and, and you almost don't utter a word and God sees your heart and thinks is right. Other times you're in hours. You maybe take a day of fasting, but you're going to get right. Sometimes like David here, how long he was, he was seeking, but he was not believing anything else that God would restore him. Because God is a covenant-keeping God. Amen. He's a covenant-keeping God. He will. But even in how that works, it's all relational, do you see? It's not, hey, say these words, then you're right. Walk this way. You know, go on your knees like this. It's relational. Get serious with Jesus. Allow Him in your heart. And if it takes three hours to get right into that place and God breaks you there, you can walk out with your face shining, full of joy, singing when you walk out. Victory, I'm in that place again. I'm dwelling. I'm dwelling in the place of the Most High. I'm in that place again. I've made peace with my Father in heaven. We're talking now. These graces in my life. I've learned my lesson I hope you've heard what the Lord has put on my heart. This is crucial for us as a church to start walking in. And I want to challenge the, the, the worship leaders here. We, we, need, we need to find a place where we can have this reality in the church, even when we meet, for people to be ready to, to be with God. And we, I know we have an order of things and how things works, but we, the Holy Spirit is the... Break the order. That's right. Break the yoke. I, I feel there's a yoke sometimes on us, you know. Something hindering the grace of God. May the Lord break. It says the anointing breaks the yoke of Assyria. We want to invite the Lord, any, any yoke over your life to be broken today in the name of Jesus. Any yoke that is hindering the grace of God in this church to be broken. Lord, we give you the right to deal with us. Psalm 32, one of the, 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 the penitential psalms, God's hand falls on David. He says, I was silent, but your hand was heavy upon me. And it says that heaviness of your hand upon me. Finally, I just broke down and I confessed. And when I confessed and I opened up, Lord, then there was forgiveness and there was deliverance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the will of God for you. I need to stop now. But yeah, may the Lord bless you. And maybe there's something that, that you take seriously.